she was the Army Nurse Corps, she was a physical therapist, and she was assigned to take care of German prisoners, <coughs> physical therapy. And she told me, I know they were just wanting to get my hands on their body. And I hated it, but she was a military person. She did what was told, and she gave them the massage and the treatments that some of them probably didn't even need. And this is a little twist here. She had been married to a Muskegon man, Lamar Zimmerman. He was killed. Later on, she married another man, and I met both of them at a physical coaching center in Muskegon. So she's included with her deceased husband also. This uh, Marine, I had so many meetings with him. He's no longer with us, but I often meet him at uh, Burger King. And each time he'd give me a little bit more. He told me the uh, problem over there in the Japanese area was at nighttime, you didn't dare have everybody go to sleep at once. You always had somebody on guard duty. And when it was his turn to sleep that particular night, he was lying on his back. He had his 45 right there on his chest. And then he heard a slight sound. He awakened. He was looking into the face of a Japanese soldier with a double-handed sword. Well, that 45 was empty. His great-grandson today has that sword as a memento of how close uh, he came. The most ironic thing about Chuck is he, he didn't have a left arm when I met him. And I thought maybe it was from the war. No. He was driving to Burger King one morning and got in a car accident. <laughs> how ironic. This uh, nice family here shows the two little boys dressed up like sailors and their dad. He was 100 years old when I met him. Not only was he there, but the two boys were there my age. And their children were there too. Well, have you ever talked to somebody who is not just hard of hearing but deaf? He was 100 years old. He was so happy to have me come and visit. His grandson came all the way from Chicago to be there. And I would ask a question, what was your rank? The grandson would always sit right next to him and say, what was your rank? <laughs> and sometimes you have to do it a couple or three times. but. The information came through. And somebody later on told me, Why didn't you just write the question down? Well, he was blind too. <laughs> oh, what a nice man. No information available. Well, there's a Ganyan company in Muskegon, and they have the picture. They have the information. It's just that nobody ever bothered to check with them. This man has the only X-rated picture. Some of you would, yeah, you notice, know right? Mark, are you here? Okay, good. She insisted that we use this picture. And you're going to learn a couple of things here. You can see that he was highly decorated during the war, 43 to 45, and then he uh, stayed in later. He was involved with uh, being a B-29 group during the final days of the war. We bombed Japan constantly. As soon as we got those islands close to Japan in our hands, we could directly attack Japan all the time. Many missions. And there was hardly any uh, defense. The Japanese air uh, force was pretty well wiped out. Have you ever heard of an incendiary bomb? Okay, here we go. On the right, 
That is maybe the only picture you'll ever see of an incendiary bomb. It's a package of little tubes. And each tube is filled with napalm. And when the bomb is dropped, when it gets to a certain height, those bands holding it together fly apart. Each one of those tubes flies off. And at a certain point, they ignite. This is Tokyo on the left at night. Well, they had blackouts just like we had. So the only lights you see here are fires. These are incendiary bombing attacks that we're using constantly against Tokyo and some other cities. And you might think, how cruel. In one of these Tokyo attacks, there were more civilians killed than were killed at Hiroshima. Nearly 100,000 one night. And you might think, cruel? Well, what you might not know is that the factories, the military factories, had been pretty well bombed out, so the Japanese had become a cottage industry. Each family would have a little workshop in their house, and they would be making certain parts. They'd make eight or nine of them. Somebody would come the next day and take them to the assembly plants so that they could continue the war for their emperor. We had to bomb Tokyo. It was a military target and they would not quit. All this bombing we did, they wouldn't quit until the second time, second atomic bomb. Russ Mize isn't here tonight, but he's part of the group called the Red Arrow Division, and he was interviewed on television about his part in the war in 1942. He's 94 years old. He's one of my neighbors. I've visited him many times. I've known him my whole life. And when he was interviewed, Russ is not somebody to hold back an opinion. He said, when I got there in Luna, in New Guinea, the first battle, bullets were flying right by me, and he said, that some bitch is trying to kill me. <laughs> he, he already uh, realized what was happening. Well, a couple of years ago, this is the Red Arrow, of course, the arrow going straight through that uh, horizontal line. The horizontal line indicates the enemy position in the red arrow, World War I, World War II, and today, always goes through. Several years ago, I was able to give a talk about the Red Arrow Division. Stan Yastrzemski is here. Yes. Russ and Stan, they both live in my neighborhood, and they're the last ones left from the Red Arrow Division. Have you ever heard of a book called The Ghost Monk Boys? If you read this book, your whole attitude will change about World War II. Stan and Russ and several other Muskegon men are featured in this book. We keep coming back and have references to them. I have three of these books. You're welcome to borrow any of them. Keep them as long as you need. All you have to do is contact me and also happened up with two of these books. Many people have read it and their life has changed because of it. When I gave this talk here three years ago, we had five of these Red Arrow Division people sitting right here. And before I got started, I said, Russ, I hope I get your story straight. And he said, you better or I'll kick your butt. <laughs> I said, Russ, I don't think you could get your foot up that high. <laughs> Ruth, are you here? Oh, good. I thought so. You won't mind saying or telling me, having me tell that uh, you're in your 90s, right? 97. Women's Army Corps. And I'm telling you a little if you live long enough to get a plot in for being 97. We've got a 99-year-old lady here, too. I don't have her picture, but uh, Lillian, where are you? Okay. You will be 99 this year. Two weeks from today. Isn't it funny how when a woman is in her 20s or 30s or 40s, she doesn't brag about how old she is. She's been at a certain age. Well, 
Uh, the Women's <laughs> Army Corps, that's the only person I have from that group, Ruth, I'm, I'm showing you her because she reached the uh, rank of captain, which is quite remarkable. She was in for the whole war, and she was part of the organ or part of the uh, theater of war called CBI, China, Burma, India. She spent most of her time in India, and she has been a real helpful person in this project because she knows everybody. And she refers me to people. So I've been able to include more people. No information available. Now, can you imagine trying to find relatives of a Carl Smith? <laughs> oh, yeah. Get off the phone book. Well, will his son raise his hand, please? Yeah. This is Carl Smith's son. And it was not me who found him. It was one of our three genealogists who are just working like bulldogs. So it's no information available according to the Chronicle, but there it is. All this information. So your dad is uh, always remembered in Muskegon. Uh, not just a name, but a real person. One of my friend's names is Bob Hagen. Bob, would you just raise your hand? OK. I never met Bob's dad. But he was a pilot, and he said something about uh, John Lackwell. He said, that guy must have been a really good pilot. That was back in 59 when the whole world heard about it. Bob's dad was a first lieutenant and a co-pilot. And Bob has told me a few things that really caught my attention. They were in a uh, former German fighter base which has a shorter runway. So it's, it was seized, of course, by the Americans. And it wasn't really perfect for B-24s. Well, when they would set up a mission, they didn't just all take off at once. You could have several hundred B-24 bombers going on a mission. They had to take off one at a time. And this is what you would see if you were there there would always be three airplanes involved. One of them, in the distance, was just becoming airborne. One of them, halfway there, was racing down the runway as fast as it possibly could in order to get off the shorter runway. And then the other airplane was sitting still with the, uh, this is a B-24 with four in they wanted to get every advantage to get off, get airborne. So the pilot would be running the engine at absolutely screaming top speed. Imagine sitting with your car and racing that engine for several minutes. You wouldn't dare do that. But they had to do that, and the other foot was on the brake as hard as they could hold it. Because as soon as the signal came, he would release the brake he would head down the runway, and then another airplane would taxi into position. And when all of these several hundred airplanes would be in the sky at once, they would gather together in a group. They would go on their mission. He was in uh, Italy and flew quite a few missions there. Is this man's family here? Okay. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Uh, Farrell McDonald. All I had was a newspaper clipping and a, a grainy photograph until I met his niece. All right? And you're going to learn something about American history, also Muskegon history. The SS Leopold was not a military ship, but it was carrying almost an entire division. 66th Division and was ready. I can't tell you the entire story, but this lady back here has researched it and read books and got plenty of information about her uncle because he died on the SS Leopold. And this is a painting of the scene. They were five miles offshore in France and they were uh, attacked by a German submarine 
And this is an example of what, in effect, is a troop ship. Almost everybody was lost. Let's just go back and check. Um, 802 men gone, all at once. All Muskegon soldiers from that particular division. And he is uh, memorialized, or is he actually buried? He was never recovered, so he is at the uh, Normandy American Cemetery, and his picture has been placed there, too. Mr. Malone? Yes? Uh, that painting that you just did was done by one of the survivors of the old There were survivors. I'm sorry? There were survivors. The painting is of a survivor. Yeah. Of, many, of survivors. many, of course, were lost. And if I get any little detail of somebody's story wrong, Remember, I get these stories from the veterans themselves who are telling the story as they remember it. And then it comes to me, or sometimes I get it from second or third hand. The USS Indianapolis. Some of you may have heard that first when you saw the movie Drops. This was a tremendous disaster for America. These three people are all Muskegon. Heavy cruiser USS Indianapolis had just dropped off the parts for the first atomic bomb at Tinian. And it was only a few days later that the bomb was dropped on Japan. Well, the ship had done what it was supposed to do, and it was ordered to go right to the Philippines. No escort. They were all alone in Japanese infested waters. And there, there were submarines around, but nobody knew who, where they were. The ship was hit by a torpedo from a submarine. This man was in a group that went down with the ship. He was killed right away. I got the picture from his sister, who now has passed away. This man in the middle, if you've ever seen the movie In Harm's Way, those men went through absolute hell in the ocean for four days, never daring to drink even a sip of the water. And they had no water. And the sun was beating down. It was, it was a hellish situation. Just as they were found and rubber rafts were being dropped from airplanes, Paul, the Muskegon man, like all of these, swam toward the raft and a shark got Many of those men were killed by sharks. So altogether, only about a third of these men survived. And one of them was Bill Thurpen. Maybe years ago you saw him uh, as a stock car racer in the ski. He was the only one of the three who lived a long life. So we had three different categories of people. See, these are not just names. They are real people. Trujillo. Is Linda here? Here. In the mask? Oh, good. Okay. Killed in action, May 16, 1943, on Okinawa. There were no Americans on Okinawa at all in 1943. The uh, Battle of Okinawa began on the first day of May of 1945. It was the last battle of the war. But the Chronicle, even today, says he died in 43. Well, it's a small mistake, but there are lots of small mistakes that can be corrected easily. Okay, this is how we remember our men who were killed. This is uh, Linda's dad, right there. No information at all. This is at the Causeway Veterans Memorial. How often do you see young people going there studying all these things? How often do you see anybody doing it? That's the only way they're remembered. Except if you can make contact with the family. Okay, this is a news article which I had for a couple of years. And then somehow Linda found me. That's Linda. <coughs> and her dad, and his 
sacrifice was so remarkable that I put the uh, actual citation right there so people would know in the future this man gave his all. He sacrificed himself so his friends could live. When his company was pinned down by heavy Japanese machine gun fire, Private Trujillo, seeing men evacuating wounded, being cut down, stood up in full view of the enemy, and in the face of fierce fire, advanced against the enemy position, firing into the emplacement until he was in grenade range. After throwing two grenades, one of which silenced the position, he was fatally wounded. This display of gallantry and intrepidity, intrepidity although costing him his life, undoubtedly saved the lives of many of his comrades, and his duty will ever serve as an inspiration to American fighting men. Okay, he's not just a name, he's a real person. Wally Wood, how many have ever heard of Wally Wood? What a guy. I must have met with him a hundred times, and he would tell me about all his friends who died on open hour. To them, he, he would say, this was Kenny, this was Bobby, this was another Bobby, and he'd talk about them and give me all the details. And he helped me so much in this project. Even today, when I drive by the new home, I think, and then I realize, no, I can't stop and see Wally. What a wonderful guy. This is the best picture we had of this particular man until his relative gave me a copy of the page from Collier Magazine. Some of you may remember Collier Magazine. This was a full page Chesterfield advertisement giving all his information. Because when he was on furlough, before he went down with 498 men on a troop ship, he was in New York and somebody spotted him and hired him to be a model for Chesterfield. <coughs> so uh, it was either use that picture or use that. 436 men from Muskegon were killed. They were real people. We have pictures of all of them except these seven. Now I have located with help the niece, two nieces of this man, and the sister, and the nephew, four people. And they have the picture. They've told me they have the picture. We'll get back with you. We're still waiting. And these, these others are, we know a lot about them, but sometimes it's just impossible. card that you have could be uh, used to include other veterans. Some of you may be thinking of an uncle or a brother or somebody who is not already included. Keep that card and instead of just telling me the person's name that I should call, I'd really love it if you talk to that person and have them call me. Have you uh, noticed the phone book is becoming less and less useful? It's almost useless. Or when you know the number's in there and you call it, very often <coughs> this number has been disconnected or is not served. Or, because people are so afraid of telemarketers, I call them, they will not answer the phone because they assume it is a scam. I could do so much more but if you can have somebody call me, that is a real treat. Because then I don't get hung up on or sworn at or who knows what. It's free. All they need is a picture. Well, I've enjoyed, I, I wish I could tell all your stories. But I hit a few high spots and I didn't make too many mistakes, did I?